Thank you everybody for coming this evening and uh, thank you Sunshine for the introduction and for being a part of organizing this event. And um, I certainly want to thank also Doug Noble for uh, extending the invitation to me. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm very pleased to be here at RIT and in particular addressing an audience you know, like this. Uh, and I want to thank my fellow panelists for helping to make this event what I think it'll be, an engaging event. About three years ago, over in Syracuse, we started hearing that the Reaper drone was coming to Hancock Air Base, and that the Hancock had become the national maintenance center for the Reaper. Since then, we've heard that Hancock is actually piloting Reapers over Afghanistan. Hancock is the home of the 174th Fighter Wing of our local New York Air National Guard. The Hancock military base is on the northern edge of Syracuse, separate from but contiguous to Hancock International Airport. Some here may not be familiar with the Reaper drone. A drone is an unmanned robotic vehicle, whether on land, sea, or in the air. The Reaper drone is an ultra high tech unmanned aircraft, a whole new level of robotic aerial warfare. The Reaper is a high flying, long flying, fuel efficient, 36 foot long robot. It's also a sharp shooting, lethal device that the Pentagon proudly describes as a hunter-killer. Check, check out the terminology. Hunter-killer, reaper, so forth. It's very menacing technology, uh, nomenclature. Hunter-killer means that the drone is used for both surveillance and assassination. The reaper is armed with Hellfire missiles and 500-pound bombs. Although it is unmanned, the Reaper is launched by a ground crew, often mercenaries, over there. It's sometimes, you know, clandestine airstrips. But once the Reaper is airborne, it's piloted via satellite link by a technician using a joystick at a computer console. Generally, the technician is on the ground here in the U.S., thousands of miles from any target. Targets include vehicles, buildings, and human beings, especially in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, but also elsewhere. The Reaper has extraordinary surveillance capabilities. Its camera can see, record, and transmit from several miles in the air. These cameras can see at night, they can see through clouds, they can distinguish children from adults, even at great heights. These camera systems send back vast amounts of real-time imagery to the pilot back at Hancock, or at any of the five other Reaper bases throughout the U.S. In nearby Rome, former Rome Air Base, uh, Rome, New York, ultra-high tech computer playstations are being developed to help process all this imagery. In 2008, former Republican Congressman James Walsh hailed the arrival of the Reaper locally. Jim Walsh said Reaper pilots, excuse me, Jim Walsh said that Reaper pilots will be, quote, literally fighting a war in Iraq and at the end of the shift, playing with their kids in Camillus. Camillus being a western suburb of Syracuse. Walsh was succeeded by Congress, con Congressional Rep Dan Maffei, who lost the election last November. Dan, though he originally was elected as an anti-Iraq war candidate, also supported the Reaper in our midst. Senator Chuck Schumer, according to his February 10th press release, wants to expand Hancock's role as a Reaper hub. 
Schumer says he is, quote, committed to working in overdrive to ensure that Hancock is chosen as a drone test site, unquote. This past Friday, March 25th, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand visited Hancock. She was personally briefed on the Reaper by Colonel Kel Kevin Bradley, the commander of the 174th. The next day, Syracuse Post Standard, Corey Gillibrand, is saying, this technology will save lives. The Reaper, she said, quote, can do so much to support the men and women on the ground, giving them the intelligence to make sure they do their job effectively, unquote. Now, before I go on to talk about how grassroots folks across upstate New York, in contrast to their elected representatives, are responding <coughs> to the Reaper, I want to say a few words about why the Reaper is no friend to any of us. I want to explain why the Reaper does more to jeopardize lives than save them. The key thing to realize here is that, yes, this new gee whiz technology is tactically clever. And within narrow contexts, in fact, can save certain lives. Since the Reaper has no crew on board, there's no one to get hungry or sick or tired or captured. <clears throat> there is no pilot or navigator or gunner to be shot down or die in a crash or collision. This, of course, means no awkward body bags coming back to the US. Body bags that force us to ask, how much blood are we willing to pay for our insatiable appetite for oil? Now, compared to, say, an F-16 fighter jet, <coughs> the Reaper is pretty cheap, maybe $10 million a pop. A corporation out in San Diego, General Atomics, Inc., can produce the Reaper relatively quickly. And it can be disassembled and readily containerized for transport overseas via cargo plane, ship, or truck. Unlike a manned fighter jet, the Reaper can hover high over a target, invisibly and unheard for hours at a time, waiting for the right moment. Its ordnance is laser guided for extreme accuracy. Its kill radius is small. In other words, if a Reaper targeted you folks down there in the corner of the room, we up here on the panel would probably remain unscathed. Such capability is ideal for extrajudicial executions that the Reaper is so often used for. Although there's no courage involved in deploying the Reaper, in fact, some might suggest that their use is cowardly, it's understandable why the Pentagon sees drone technology as the wave of the future. I mean, right now, the Pentagon is training more drone pilots than, you know, actual plane pilots, you know, manned plane pilots. Now, given all these advantages, why do I and others across New York State oppose the Reaper? One reason is that the Reaper further distances not only military personnel, but citizens from the wars fought in our name and with our tax money. Canadian politician and academic Michael Ignatiev puts it this way, quote, if war becomes unreal to the citizens of modern democracies, will they care enough to restrain and control the violence exercised in their name? Ignatiev goes on to ask, will citizens of modern democracies restrain and control the violence if they and their sons and daughters are spared the hazards of combat? Such distancing 
makes mission drift oh so easy. Already, Reapers have been used for deadly missions in Yemen and Somalia. The Reaper is difficult to detect and track. So far, it's mostly been used in remote areas where media scrutiny is scanty. Hence, civilian casualty figures are hard to come by. But here, to give you an idea of the scale of the casualties, are some stats from one country, Pakistan. In 2007, there was only one drone attack, but it killed 20 human beings. In 2008, there were 19 attacks that killed 156 human beings. In 2009, There's an error. There were, okay, I'm a little, my numbers got screwed up here. Anyway, in 2009, there were 46 attacks that killed 536 human beings. In the first seven months of 2010, there were 41 attacks in Pakistan that killed 366 human beings. In other words, each year there are more Reaper attacks and more victims. Few pilots have any real knowledge of their victims, or their culture, or motivation, or circumstances. Few have adequate grounding in the legal implications of their actions. While they are essential topics, tonight I'm not even going into the legality and immorality of how the Pentagon and the CIA use the Reaper. Despite their ignorance, those piloting the Reaper often play investigator, prosecutor, jury, judge, and executioner. They make life and death decisions. They get to play God. Not the best role models for spreading democracy, for spreading our Christian way of life. All of this is happening under the Obama administration. All this has been accelerating under the Obama administration. Curiously, a major portion of this bloodshed is happening in Pakistan, with whom we're not even at war. It is such distancing, along with the CIA black operations, that make mission drift oh so easy. The Reaper, this Pentagon toy, is likely to get us into a heap of trouble. But who among us will know? Who will care? What the voters and taxpayers and letters to the editor writers and university researchers here need to realize is that while the Reaper is tactically clever, it is strategically stupid. In Pakistan, the CIA, with no judicial process, with no judicial safeguards, uses the Reaper to assassinate those it considers the enemy, alleged Taliban and Al-Qaeda operatives. Never mind the so-called collateral damage. Unfortunately, because so much of what passes for intelligence is dubious, even spurious, especially in remote regions where few US personnel speak the local language or know the local culture, it often happens that the targets are mistaken. And so, thanks to these flailing and trigger-happy manhunts, many innocents are maimed or killed or have their homes destroyed. Thousands are displaced and forced to flee the region. These refugees and the friends and relatives of the victims surely have long memories. Quite likely, they'll remain hostile to the U.S. for years to come. In places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, the Pentagon tells us we're engaged in anti-insurgency warfare. And an important element of anti-insurgency warfare is winning hearts and minds. What could more quickly undermine the strategy of winning hearts and minds than the kind of terrorism that the Reaper 